Okay, welcome to Computer Networks. This is Lecture 11. Let's uh, get started because we have a lot of things to cover today. Uh, but first, just wanted to remind you that homework 5 is due today. Uh, we can spend a minute or two talking about uh, anything you want to discuss about homework 5 if you want. But I hope most of you uh, has already submitted. Is that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and exam 1 is on Monday. Uh, so I wanted to uh, spend a few minutes talking about the exam at the end of the uh, lecture today. Uh, but just wanted to remind you that uh, you can bring a page of notes. You can write it in small letters if you want, but one page means one page, okay? No, it's just uh, one page. Yeah, you can do either the front or the back. Your choice, front or the back. <laughs> Okay, any, any, like, a, like a legal size page? Yes. <laughs> you, can, you can also use A4. <laughs> okay. Um, last semester, what happened was um, one of the students said, I didn't want to write in small letters, uh, so I just wrote in very large letters, so I just brought two pages. I had to say no. So uh, you, can, you can print if you want. In eight points or six points, but uh, if you look at the practice problems I posted, you'll realize that having a lot of notes is not going to help. We got a chance to look at the practice problems. I posted it uh, not 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 too long ago, and that's the type of questions uh, there will be at least a significant part of the exam. I understand those are a little bit challenging problems. There'll be easier ones as well. But uh, for those questions, it's just not going to help. You can write, you can bring as much notes as you want. If you don't understand it, there's just not enough time, right? So uh, just try to understand the concepts that we talked about in concrete details. And uh, those uh, practice problems give you an idea for what I mean by concrete details. Is today's lecture going to be on the exam? Um, we'll try to spend a little bit of time on the exam at the end. Okay. Uh, the oh, yes, yeah, the yes, content. sorry, yes, okay. yes, it, it'll be in the exam, including the student presentation topics. So it'll be your responsibility to understand what they are. We didn't get a chance to do them. I think uh, we were able to do discussions about two of those topics, right? Uh, I'm happy to start threads discussing the rest of them. Uh, of course, I don't want uh, you to understand nitty gritty details about those systems, but the general idea, okay? All right. Now we're going to talk about uh, transport protocols today. Just uh, wrap it up. And uh, hopefully, there'll be at least 10 minutes towards the end to talk about the exam. So, last time we started talking about how can network help TCP or some other end to end transport protocols and what, what their role might be if they, if they can do something useful. And one of the things that uh, we talked about is sometimes if the senders and the receivers, they don't adhere to the standard way of adjusting the windows, uh, one flow could start the other flow. In order to prevent that, maybe we can build some mechanism into the network to detect such condition and give better feedback or even enforce some policies. And one of the techniques that we talked about is called random early detection. So the idea here is we compute an average of the queue size on the router and start marking the packets if the average exceeds certain threshold. That's what we talked about, right? And we also discussed why we want to use average instead of instantaneous queue size. Who remembers why? Anyone? No? Why, why do we want to use average? So that you don't get decoyed by somebody sending a quick burst of packets? Yeah, basically we, we're interested in longer term fairness or long, longer term behavior rather than instantaneous. We want to be able to absorb longer term bursts or, so, or bursts over long term so that you can maintain your average rates, average marking probabilities for example. This is what the curve looks like that we might use to mark the packets. 
if uh, the average queue size is below a certain threshold, we don't mark the packets. If uh, the average queue size is between two thresholds, we mark those packets with certain probability. And if the average queue size is above a certain threshold, we mark all the packets. I wanted to clarify what marking means. And we discussed uh, two of them last time. You could mark the data going from the sender to the receiver. If the receiver, we trust the receiver to do the right thing in terms of uh, um, advertising maybe smaller window to the sender or sending feedback to the sender. We could do that, right? We could have these routers send special messages to the sender instead. And the third technique that we might employ when we have this kind of information is having the router drop the packets. We didn't talk about that last time. But marking, um, we could think of marking as something that includes all of these techniques. That's an abstract concept, right? So what happens if we have the router drop the packets with uh, those probabilities? We could have different types of queues. Let's think about the simple case where all the packets are queued to the same buffer or same queue, let's say, of all the flows. So if we're using this curve to, let's say, drop the packets, and let's say there is one flow that is using um, more than its fair share of the capacity, what would happen, or you know, how many packets will we drop from that larger flow compared to the smaller flow? Yeah. It'll be more. And we should be able to say exactly how much more if I tell you the size of each flow at a given time, right? So any questions uh, there? Okay. So if uh, flow is using more, more of its packets will be dropped or marked. How about the other flows? Let's say there is a flow that's using very small, less than its share of the capacity. Its packets might also get marked, although it's smaller probability, if we're using the same queue, right? All right, so here's the summary. Probability of dropping a packet is going to be roughly proportional to the share of the bandwidth being used by the flows. And that's a desirable property, right? And because we're using averages, we can observe the bursts. So that is what, what I asked you earlier. So is, is this enough? Let's say we're using the red and uh, we're queuing all the packets uh, into the single queue and dropping the packets in proportion um, to their use of the capacity. Is that enough? Or could we do more? So let's think about that. One of the problems that we just mentioned is we are marking the packets even from smaller flows, although with uh, smaller probability, but we're still marking them or dropping them. That's uh, clearly not desirable. right? So what can we do about that? And there is uh, yet another problem, which is there could be, um, so the scenario that I just described could happen due to bugs or some misinterpretation of some standards, or it could be just a malicious flow. Let's say you want to prevent other people from um, transferring any packets, this is exactly what you should do. Send a lot of your packets so that their packets also get dropped with certain probability as soon as the aggregate average goes above a certain threshold. Right? And uh, if we're just uh, using uh, red to mark the packets, the sender doesn't have to uh, respond to the feedback that the router is giving anyway, right? So it seems like we need some kind of enforcement action inside the network, and the idea is to use multiple queues. So we're going to use one queue per flow. That's the idea. Is that it'll allow us to isolate the flows. We manage each flow separately, and we can assign a certain rate to each flow. That's the idea. We could... Um, uh, so here's how we might design these... Um, multiple queues system. Uh, let's say we allocate one queue per flow. And every, let's say, second, just to make the discussion easier, 
we transmit one packet from each queue. Sounds like a fair allocation, doesn't it? So let's say we have n queues. And every second, let's say our capacity is n, we grab one packet from the first queue, we transmit that. Grab a packet at the head of the second queue, transmit that. And so on and so forth. And we do that every second. Seems like uh, this would result in fair allocation of the bandwidth. Do you see any problem with that? There's the hint. So some of the flows might send larger packets or larger segments. And they might get larger share. Even, even though we've implemented the, the queues for each flow, and even if we're grabbing just one packet every cycle, there are some flows that are able to still capture higher bandwidth. So what's the solution? Does everyone understand the problem? Yeah, so we have a problem, right? Because some flows are going to send larger packets, and they're going to get higher share of the bandwidth. The solution is to do the accounting bit by bit, rather than packet by packet. That's the idea. Does it make sense? But there is a problem. The packet has to be transmitted in its entirety. We can't just uh, chop the packet into two pieces and transmit the first part. Or we can't just say, OK, here's the first bit from this packet and transmit the first. We can't do that, can we? No. Just think of, uh, for example, um, HTTP uh, headers that you might send from the HTTP client to the server. Um, just to make it fair across many HTTP clients, you can't just say, I'm going to send just the you know, first byte from this connection. And then you, you can't do that, because some these headers are interpreted um, as a whole. These packets are processed interpreted and processed as a whole, right? So what's the solution? Just keep track of how big the packets are and make sure everyone's kind of going at the same rate. Yeah, so we, we need to somehow keep track of it. We can't just uh, go to the first queue, grab the first bit and transmit, go to the second queue, grab the bit at the head, and we can't do that. We need to somehow keep track of how many bits we've transmitted from each queue, right? So that's the idea. You use a fluid flow type model to keep track of these bits that you've transmitted from each, each flow. And um, you would serve the packets in the order they would uh, finish in a fluid flow system. And I, I will tell you uh, exactly what I mean by that. Um, just to give you a high-level idea, uh, what we want is uh, not do a packet-by-packet packet schedule. And let's look at the first uh, flow and the second flow. Clearly, these packets are of different sizes. If we use uh, this packet-by-packet packet fair queuing, it's not going to work. It's not going to be fair. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve. So in order to implement fair queuing, let's uh, introduce some um, uh, symbols here just to make it easier. Uh, for me to describe this concept in the next slide. So let's say PI is the length of a packet I, all right? And SI is the I's start transmission time. And FI would be the end <coughs> transmission time for a given packet on a queue. And FI is SI plus PI, right? So we're going to compute the finished transmission time for each packet. So we have all the packets queued up. Let's say we have n queues, and then we're going to compute the finish time for each packet. And we're going to schedule the packet transmission by looking at the finish time, not the start time, but the finish time. So whichever packet would have the smallest FI, we're going to transmit that packet first, and then the second smallest, and then the third smallest. All right? Now, if we go look at this uh, diagram, let's look at the finish times. Um, let's say we've already transmitted, let's say, packet one and two, right? Uh, because the first queue was empty. And we received packet one from flow one, and we received packet three from flow two. So these are the two queues. Which one has a smaller finish time? 
flow 1 has a smaller finish time. So we're going to transmit flow 1. So do people understand this idea? So does it solve that problem that we're talking about? It does. And the reason we had to use this trick is because the packets cannot be preempted. That's the reason. For example, we're, once we start transmitting a packet, we can't really stop transmitting that packet. So let's say we have a large packet, and we're transmitting that. And while we're transmitting that large packet, uh, there could be a bunch of smaller packets in the other queue. Uh, we can't really stop transmitting this large packet and start serving the smaller packets. What we would do instead is compute the finish time, and of course the finish time for a small number of these small packets is going to be smaller than the finish time for this large packet. So we might actually transmit a number of smaller packets from the first queue before servicing the packet from the second queue. All right. So the advantage is we can ensure that all the flows get fair share of the capacity. Right? Are we convinced about that? Yeah, OK. So that, that's, that's the clear advantage. What's the disadvantage? Well, we need to keep track of finish times and start times. So it makes the router implementation a little bit more complex than just maintaining n queues and grabbing the first packet of the queue and transmitting that. It's a little bit more complex. And here is what um, we would get if we use fair queuing. When we have a large number of flows and some flows taking more than their fair share of the bandwidth, if we use fair, share, fair queuing, we can give approximately fair share of the capacity to all the flows. And this is what the diagram shows. So here the, here's the big picture. Fair queuing does not eliminate congestion. Are we convinced about that? We didn't talk, even talk about congestion. We are just worried about some flows taking more than their fair share of bandwidth. That's, that's the only thing that we're worried about when we're talking about fair queuing. Right? How about red? What, what are we solving with red? It, it comes down to packet marking and how you're marking the packets or dropping the packets. So what are we doing with the red? We're marking packets on flows that are sending more than their share. Right? We're uh, so if there is a flow that's sending large number of packets, a large fraction of those packets are going to get marked compared to the flow that is sending fewer packets. Right? With fair queuing, we're making it even stricter. Trying to do the same thing. Yeah. But uh, fair king provides isolation. You probably heard of that phrase when we, when, when we started operating systems, isolating different processes from each other, for example. Here we are isolating different processes, uh, different uh, flows, not processes. Because uh, if there is a flow that tries to send as many packets as possible, um, the fair queuing router will not uh, service those packets at the desired rate. It will only transmit the packets at the fair share rate. But if you want congestion control, you obviously need different mechanisms. That's what I wanted to say there. So here is something for you to think about. Um, I'm not going to give you an answer to this, but uh, how would you design a system that would um, so we we talked about how to design a system that would give fair share to each flows even though we can't preempt the packets we actually came up with a way to address that problem how would you design a system that would give let's say two um, x the share to one flow compared to the other how would you design a system I think uh, you should be able to easily design that system by just tweaking the fair queuing algorithm that we talked about. Let's say we have two flows and we want to give uh, you know, rate n to one flow and then rate two n to the other flow. How would you, how would you do that? So I want you to think about that. Okay. All right. So moving on. Let's um, 
wrap up our discussion of transfer protocols, particularly TCP, by thinking about uh, some of the emergent behaviors of TCP because of the way it's specified, some of the things that you can tweak about TCP. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about cheating TCP. And a lot of times this means how to get more out of your network, how to get more out of TCP. Right? One of the things that TCP does is limit the rate at which you can use the network, right? That doesn't seem so good, especially if you want to get the maximum performance from your network, TCP is actually working against you, right? So the obvious thing to do is tweak TCP so that you can get higher data rates. So the first thing that you can do is increase the window faster, right? Because uh, we said uh, in TCP there are these algorithms uh, that tell you how quickly you're allowed to increase the window. For example, if you're in congestion avoidance phase, you're allowed to increase the window by approximately one every round trip time. Why not increase it by two? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to increase the window faster? To get more packets flowing quicker. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what we want, right? So why would you ever want to not do this? <laughs> as an individual. It makes sense to do it, right? And most operating systems allow you to configure these things. For example, if you're on Microsoft Windows, you can go to registry, and I'm sure there are these uh, parameters that you can tweak. And uh, Linux has its own system. It's uh, pretty easy to configure these things. Another thing that you could do is uh, you could use a large initial window. We said uh, when TCP starts, after we've done um, scene, synac, ACK, you send one segment, and if you receive an ACK, you send approximately two segments, right? Then if you, if you receive all the ACKs, then you double the number of segments that you're sending. So that's the slow start behavior that we talked about, right? So why start with one? You could start with four. Send four segments, and uh, if you receive all the ACKs, go to eight. So how much does that save you? How many round trips does that save you? starting with four in step one. Just to be able to calculate these things, otherwise you're going to be in trouble in, exam, in, in the exam, okay? Two, two rounders, you said two rounders. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's a good thing, but it's not a hugely good thing. D depends on where you're downloading the data from, right? Depends, depends on how long the round trip is, yeah. right? If you're downloading data from uh, far away, this could be huge. So why don't you guys do this? Well, why do you guys use default TCP? <laughs> you, you, you're, you're making your own life miserable deliberately. Because <laughs> if too many people uh, cheat TCP, then it stops handling congestion control properly. Yeah. So you're doing this for social good. But wait, so if, uh, if we do that, is there a way? Uh, Say so system administrator can detect it and just ban your IP address? Well, I want you to think about that yourself. Let's say you're the server. Uh, so that would be your yeah. server. But there are many, many system administrators in the world. Maybe they won't all use this technique that you're going to develop. Right? Or maybe your, your ISP or whatever. Yeah. So there are two parties, right? Maybe your ISP could do something. Can they, well, can they detect it? Well, and this is most useful for sending mm -hmm. data. You know, if you yeah. don't have any way of altering those settings on the person that's sending data to you. Yeah. And so the system administrator is the one who makes the choice whether or not to use it. Yeah. You know, if you're hosting a server, you don't really care whether or not people use this because yeah. they're not sending you Right. Not trivial amounts of data. Yeah, and also from server's perspective, it might actually be a good thing sometimes if the sender is able to send uh, all the data that it needs to send and close the connection. Why is that uh, sometimes better from server's perspective? Less memory for keeping track of the resources. Yeah, because it might be less resources on the server, so it's, it's actually <coughs> desirable, it seems like. Actually, if you have a slow connection, this can be helpful even if you're not a server, because on a slow connection, a uh, large part of your uh, data that you send uh, is going to be like limited by you send your headers because mm -hmm. each time you send your your, your headers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, 
when I was doing research for the speedy protocol, it mm -hmm. said that uh, on the slower K cell connection, actually headers, header size uh, is like affects up to eighty percent of the uh, of the congestion of the congestion that happens happens from the headers that traveling back and forth. Yeah. So a lot a lot of times a uh, header is a huge overhead. Yes. And um, all the sound. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? So n another technique is opening many connections. Um, I think uh, you guys all did that, or ex explored how that uh, uh, improves the rate at which you can transfer aggregate data. Were you able to observe any speed up due to concurrent connections? For the smaller, or for the larger number of smaller files, mm -hmm. I had a huge speed up. But okay. for the large files, they were like exactly the same. Okay, so uh, the comment here was, even if you open multiple connections for large <coughs> transfers, the speed up was almost a, almost none. Yeah, there was, like there's almost no speed up. But for large number of small files, the speed up was significant. So I want you to think about why that is the case. I guess that's part of the homework. Okay, but opening many connections, it seems like in certain cases, it actually helps you, right? Sometimes it slows down. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes on your server, when you open a lot of connections, it starts dropping. Okay, sometimes it could slow down. So because of the timeouts, it drops, it times out. So yeah, yeah. It actually ended up slower than downloading one connection. I see. So sometimes uh, it could uh, actually be worse to open multiple connections because we're talking about network resources as well as the server resources. Sometimes we tend to forget the server resources, right? Uh, opening multiple connections, the server has to be able to handle that. It's more memory, more resources at the server. All right, so let's, uh, um, let me show you this diagram about how the flow allocation changes when you have different flows changing their window size at different rates. You should be able to interpret this diagram, right? We, we talked about uh, th th these diagrams. Th these are the phase plots that we talked about. Each point corresponds to the rate allocation for the two flows. All right, so that's uh, pretty straightforward. Here's how the windows would evolve if um, uh, de depending on where, where you start, using a small initial window versus a large initial window. Any questions about how to interpret this? It's pretty straightforward, x-axis of time. So which flow is using a larger initial window? Tell me about the color. Red. Red. How, how, do you, how can you tell on the diagram? Yes. This is the y-axis, the window. It's, it's window. Yeah. So how can you tell it's the larger window? Well, it's uh, above the other line. <laughs> yeah. All right. So opening a lot of connections. So what's the answer here? It seems like we haven't converged on to an answer because someone said opening many connections uh, could actually make it worse. Someone said, in certain cases, opening many connections actually helps you. Right? You can uh, download things faster. Um, well, that's the that's the general thinking. Um, if you open, let's say, on flow A B, if you open, let's say, ten connections, and let's say there's another flow that uh, uh, just uses one connection, and if uh, we have the network infrastructure ensuring fair bandwidth for each flow, we're obviously going to get more bandwidth for A, B. That, that's kind of the idea, especially when you have flows competing with each other. Right? But I'm very glad to hear that there are some nuances to this, and you're starting to appreciate that because of the homework. Right? Because sometimes you know this is true, uh, sometimes this is obviously true, and sometimes it's uh, not so obvious what the answer is. I think these are all uh, important uh, observations that you have made. But at a high level, it seems like if the network is ensuring 
fair bandwidth to each flow, it seems like it's advantageous to open more flows. Now here's a question. Uh, let's say you open 100 connections. Let's say A opens 100 connections to B and B opens one connection to E. Is there a diminishing return, increasing return, or proportional return um, you know, when you increase the number of connections? What is your guess? Probably so, a diminishing return. Probably a diminishing return. Why is that? Well, if someone else, I mean, if you're effectively, if you're competing with one other, let's say you're competing with one other thing and it's only got one flow. Yeah. So when you add your second flow, you go from half of it to two thirds. Mm -hmm. And then if you, when you open your third one, you're going from two thirds to three quarters and so on. If you go from, you know, 900 flows mm -hmm. to you know, 901 flows, Yeah. then you're, you're getting that tiny sliver of, extra sliver of bandwidth. Right. So uh, when, once you've opened a certain number of connections, you're probably not going to gain much by opening more connections. And that's because the additional share that you're getting just gets smaller and smaller because it's all, um, because the system is going to allocate the available capacity fairly across all the flows, right? So the other reason is sometimes the routers might limit the rate per flow. Let's say the network has lots of capacity, but uh, they, don't want to, uh, they don't want you to use all of it, even if it is available. They might restrict the amount of data that you can transfer per flow, in which case, uh, even without considering the fairness or non-fairness, makes sense to open more connections. Now, with that, that argument is going to fall apart once we hit the network uh, capacity, right? So these are the two angles to look at when we think about concurrent connections. One is assuming a system that allows the flows to use everything that you have. Another is if there is some kind of restriction per flow. So in the homework, you, ex uh, you explored some, some type of restriction by right, a per client base basis. So in which case, if, if, even if you have multiple clients, you can, you can do better with the service that you wrote. Right? All right. So now let's uh, think about some other types of uh, um, exploits that one could think about um, in terms of getting to work TCP better for you. Okay. And these exploits that we're going to talk about today, they all take advantage of the ambiguity in the meaning of ACK. What's a standard meaning of ACK? What is an ACK? What does an ACK tell the sender? The, the receiver receives a specific number of bytes. Yeah, or receives a certain packet or segment or some byte range. That's actually what it is, right? So that, that's, what, that's what an ACK tells the receiver. But we've already talked about, um, in one of the TCP mechanisms, how ACKs can be, ACKs were actually interpreted differently. Can you, can you remember that? The triple ACKs? Yeah, the triple ACKs. Right, so we're already starting to use ACKs to mean something differently than what it's supposed to, right? So we're going to talk, talk about uh, um, exploits that take advantage of this ambiguity in the meaning of ACK. So the first is called ACK division attack. And the idea is when the receiver receives a segment with a certain number of bytes, you're supposed to ACK saying, OK, I received byte range, you know, this to this, right? Let's say I received. Uh, by, bytes, you know, 100 through 200, then I'm supposed to send an ACK saying I received, uh, you know, 200, basically, right? Or you could split that ACK into small, into multiple ACKs that acknowledge small, smaller number of segments. So why, why, why would anyone want to do this? Could be denial of service, but you're trying to use TCP to work better for you. Why, why would this work better for you? Because the uh, the sender 
Mm -hmm. Adjusts their window based on how many acts they receive. Right. You adjust the window every time you receive an act, right? So you could actually get the sender to change the window size much faster. And why do you want larger window? Why is that uh, beneficial in, anyway? Yeah, you can send more, and you can receive more. Right? So as a receiver, so let's say, let's say you want to download some uh, large files from a server, and you're a receiver, and let's say you tweaked um, the TCP that you're running on your machine to send uh, these divided acts, it can actually help you. Because you haven't uh, even touched the server, right? You've just tweaked TCP on your machine. And every, every time you receive some segment, let's say you're trying to download a file, the server is sending some data to you, and you're going to just respond with lots of acts. So without even touching the server, you're able to basically manipulate the server uh, into sending you a lot more data quickly. And this is what this uh, diagram shows in, in a result of that uh, type of experiment. You can see the data and acts as a function of time. And if you have normal TCP, it takes a certain amount of time. But if you use this kind of act division, you can do the same transfer really quickly. Right. So you haven't done anything to the server. So the experiment uh, that um, these researchers did was download a page from CNN.com. Of course, they don't have control over CNN.com website. This is tweak TCP running on their machine. So what's the defense to something like this? Well, our algorithms have to be cognizant of uh, bytes, because that's what matters when you're thinking about uh, capacity, not just number of segments that you, you know, transmitted, received, act. All right? So here's another attack called uh, dupe act spoofing. So the idea is, Upon receiving a data signal, again, we're talking about a receiver. We're trying to download a file. The receiver is going to send a long stream of acknowledgments for the last sequence number received. Okay? So why is that useful? Because it's in, in a bunch of dupe acts. You're not dividing the acts. You receive you know, data, let's say the first segment. And you're going to send a bunch of acts. First of all, tell me why the data that the sender sent at the top in the first data segment in the second series, why are, they look identical, don't they? Triple yeah, that's right. So we're using uh, multiple, uh, multiple duplicates, or duplicates or triplicates um, as a sign that the particular segment was not received. But in this case, the receiver actually received it, but he sent a lot of acts. And the server may send that and send more data packets. An ACK is used as a sign that a packet exited the network. Is that right? You never send an ACK if a packet did not exit network. Right? So if, a, if you know for sure that a packet exited the network, What's the right thing to do for the sender? Put, more, put another packet in. Yeah. You need to put more packets in. Any questions? No. OK, good. So if you do that, this is the type of performance again, gain you can, uh, you can hope, to, hope to get. Okay. You can download files a lot faster. Finally, here's the other attack called optimistic acking. So the attack is you send an act even before you receive data. Why would you ever want to do that? Why would you ever want to do that? We have to more to you. Yeah. In hopes that they receive that act after they transmit them. Yeah. So uh, first, so that that's a that's a good direction. You you're hoping that uh, this 
sender would send you more data. That's what we're trying to do. But think about the TCP throughput equation that we talked in the last lecture. So do you roughly remember the terms? What's in the denominator? Two things in the denominator, I think. Yeah. So what does optimistic acking do to the round trip time estimation done by the sender? It reduces it. Then what happens uh, to TCP? If the round trip time is smaller? It tries to have the correct number of packets in flight. Yeah. So speeds up its sender. Yeah, exactly. So the throughput should go up, right? That's, that's what the equation tells us as to you know, what kind of behavior to expect. So do people understand this attack? We're trying to get more again, right? But using a slightly different technique. What's the, but this is dangerous. So we're the receiver. We're sending you know, optimistic acts to the server. We're trying to download this large file as quickly as possible. What's the, what's the risk? You might act something you don't actually receive. Yeah, and what's the problem with that? You can't go back and say, oh, wait, never mind, I need that one. Yeah, exactly. But you could, right? Couldn't you send uh, dupe acts saying, okay, this particular segment uh, was not available? Will it process that correctly if it's already received? It'll depend on the implementation. You, you know, once uh, it really depends on you know, how much TCP is... Uh, how, how much longer TCP is willing to keep the data in the buffer. Usually, if the... If the receiver says, I received packet X, there is no reason to keep it around. Right? So that's the risk. But how serious is this risk in the wired internet, in the wireless internet? Can you compare the two? In the wireless, not so serious. In the wireless, probably the risk. Yeah, in, in wireless, the risk is probably in greater, and maybe you don't want to use it. And wireless. Depends on how like critical your data is too. Yeah. Yeah, it maybe, could depend maybe, on maybe you can miss a packet. Right? Yeah, so it could it could also depend on how critical your data is. I, I agree. Um, th this is uh, what uh, you could do with optimistic hacking. The first series of lines are basically tweaked TCP. So in all these attacks that we talked about, we have not changed the sender, which is the server. We're just try, trying to download a bunch of data from the server as quickly as possible. And uh, of course, you know, I have control over my machine. I can do whatever I want in, in that machine, right? And that's uh, what these authors did. All right, so um, this is the discussion that we almost had earlier today about uh, you know why would you ever want to use standard TCP so let's think about what, what would happen if uh, if you have two flows a B and D going through a network right the red flow and the blue flow if a and D let's say they increase the rate at which they're sending or window size by a small amount, they both get better rate, right? Have, have you seen this kind of diagram? So you probably did at least a little bit of game theory, right? At least the introduction to it or how to interpret these diagrams. Yeah, this is pretty simple. Uh, prisoner's dilemma, have you, have you heard of it? Yes. Okay, so are, are there the prisoners here, <laughs> the, the two flows? So it's, it's like a prisoner's dilemma. That's how we interpret uh, this matrix. What happens if A increases its use of the network by a large amount, and D increases D also increases its use of the network, but by a small amount? Uh, A is going to get better share, right? So what should D do in that case? Also increases by the same rate. Yeah. So. It, it uh, seems like D should also increase its rate. And then we get to the bottom right cell of that matrix, right? 
And what happens when both of them increase the rate? They're in a worse position than they were if they did just increase by one, basically? Yes. So basically, that could be too aggressive for the network. And both of them will get lower rate. All right. Um, so there is the individual incentive, which is okay. You know, we should definitely cheat using all those techniques that we talked about. Right? Because it's going to give you better rate. Why not? Why would you ever want to limit yourself? You're paying money to your ISV, and you're saying, okay, I'm just going to not use as much as I could. And um, the social incentive is, you know. Else thinks like you do. Yeah, so if, if everyone is trying to optimize TCP using the techniques that we talked about or various other techniques, there are many, then the network could actually collapse. All right, so let's take a quick break and we're going to talk about the exam, okay? Oh, yeah. 
All right, exam one. It's, uh, so these are the main topics, these three. That, that's the, that's the, those are the main topics that we covered uh, in the class so far. In the beginning, we talked about how to characterize network performance. And we talked about uh, two application layer protocols in, in detail. And then we talked about transfer protocols, various me mechanisms on, underneath. And there are miscellaneous topics, FTP versus SCTP, webpagetest.org, DHCP, dynamic DNS, and SPIDI. This is all there is in the exam. <laughs> Can we see the exam? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't have the exam yet, so I, I, I can't show it to you. It's something that I don't have. Uh, we can, we can talk about some of these uh, things because we have at least uh, ten fifteen minutes uh, today. So yeah. Yeah, there will be multiple choice uh, questions. Uh, not all the questions will be as challenging as the one that I posted. But there will be a few questions that will um, and that will make you think. <laughs> yeah, those, those will be the challenging ones. The ones says, can we discuss them right now? Can we talk about them? We just, because we were talking about one earlier. I, th I think it's better if you talk, to, uh, talk, talk with uh, everybody else. Um, because uh, some of those questions, they don't have a definite answer either. Right. Um, so is there some topic that uh, you think it's worth um, just discussing right now? I mean, this would uh, just help you refresh your memory. So those are the things that we covered so far. I have, well, are, are we going to be... Is it going to, I mean, I know we get to bring a paper, like the one page paper in and everything, but is it going to be expected that on our page we're going to have like formulas and stuff or will those be provided? Whatever you think you need. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the point is, uh, you know, you shouldn't be stressed out about memorizing <laughs> things. And that's kind of the point of that uh, paper. But I, I wouldn't rely on that paper too much uh, because uh, last semester uh, many students didn't even look at the paper that they brought. But it, it gave them it gave them a peace of mind, which is which is important, right? So that uh, you can focus on uh, uh, important things, not memorizing things. Anything about homework? Let's also discuss homework. We can just do today. Yes. Uh, for the homework on the, the second question. Yes. Um, what would we look for, like um, more information? Because I'm missing classes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know about EWA. Yeah. Like what lectures would I look at? Hmm. I would say it's probably all. Um, it so those ideas don't come from any specific lecture. We we did talk about throughput and RTT in the beginning, maybe first or second lecture. No, I think we talked a lot about that in the last four last. Yeah. So, but that is when we started talking about, at least in the first lecture, we talked about how to characterize a network, and we discussed the difference between throughput and RT, uh, RTT. And in the context of T, uh, TCP, we've been talking about that a lot, I think all throughout. We've talked about it even today, right? So um, if you're talking about uh, the throughput equation, I think we talked about that last time. Was it last week or on Monday? I forgot. Yes. And for the um, on question two also, um, when you do the moving average for the first part, mm -hmm. so like there's two bands, two one, two, 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 three, do we, can we use any moving average to come up with or mm -hmm. just stick with one? Because I know the other ones, they can't show the rate of moving average. 
Yeah. So just use a very simple average, which is you have a window of samples and just take an average. That's the, that's the easiest thing to do. One thing that I left ambiguous, so again, a lot of these questions are not fully specified, and that's deliberate. Did you think about how much you're going to slide the window by? What are the different options we have? Did I tell you how much to slide them by? No, that's the window size. You would base it off the previous. But there's another parameter, right? You could slide the window just a little bit like this, or you could slide one second at a time. I'm not going to tell you which one to do. But once you have the basic script, it's very easy to see what, uh, what difference if it, it, it makes, if any. Who, uh, how are you doing this? Maybe it's a good idea for you to share with each other. I mean, are you using Excel or are you using Excel? Excel. 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 Okay. <laughs> I should have made it more complicated. Right? <laughs> 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 this is actually this one was actually harder than the previous one, but I, I'm not good at doing simple things. Yeah. <laughs> then I need to ask a lot of simple no. things then. <laughs> Excel would be fine, actually. It's, uh, it's probably the right tool if um, you know, we have such a small data set. But you'd have to do something um, different if uh, I asked you to plot you know, lots and lots of lines. Then you'd have to do that using a script, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you, set, if you set the formula for one line, then it's... Uh, so what kind of formula are you writing? It's pretty simple. You just uh, subtract one row from another. That's the basic thing, right, to get the samples. Yeah. Anyone not using Excel? Everyone is using Excel. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What would be another choice? Um, this is a simple enough thing to do using Python, for example. And the reason why you might want to do that is um, it allows you to uh, automate a lot of these experiments that we just talked about, right? I guess in Excel, it could also be automated. But for example, in Excel, how would you do sliding when, uh, how would you control this, uh, the, the amount you slide the windows by? And make a second column and formula for it? Yeah. Plot both of the lines together? But if you wanted to say, like, okay, what difference does it make? I'm going to use, uh, uh, you know, every possible, um, you know, uh, option for slide, uh, how much to slide the window by, then it would be kind of annoying in Excel, right? But if it is a script, you just change the parameter plot one, and then you change the parameter plot another, so it will be easier. Use yeah, you could. You could use MATLAB if, if, you are, if you're experienced with that. That's almost the same as using a script. Yeah. I wouldn't use C for this. <laughs> So who is, uh, so everyone started the homework at least, right? Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. So should we talk about uh, what's uh, coming up next in the course? or Okay, so any, any other questions uh, about homework first before we move on? Okay. We will try to have an extra office hour on Friday, by the way. I wanted to, you know, think about uh, these uh, questions uh, that I posted um, and uh, and uh, if you have any questions about the general topic uh, we can um, we can definitely discuss that on Friday I, I will announce it on uh, uh, on the board okay what time what time it is very likely there will be okay very likely there will be there would be an extra office hour. Uh, you had a question. Uh, when will homework six be issued, or will be due? Posted. Posted. Okay. Um, homework six is six is still in the works. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to uh, <laughs> trying to simplify a few things about it so that uh, you focus on the important topic rather than a um, lot of. Uh, code that doesn't really help you learn much networking concepts uh, because you want to optimize your time uh, to learning concepts uh, rather than doing a lot of coding. It will be due, it will not be due next week. 
it'll be due the week after. So um, we'll have one week break in terms of um, due date. So I guess one of the previews of the course is, so who knows what this is? All right, let's let's open it. <laughs> yes, it's it's a box actually. There's nothing inside. <laughs> so um, we're gonna have some of you actually program a wireless router. So it turns out you can. Th these are these are computers, right? These are computers with some network interfaces. That's what they are. So you could actually program wireless routers and change the way they work. So some of the things uh, that, uh, so you know, I haven't decided exactly what the assignments will be. Some of the things that you will do is um, do deep packet inspection. For example, if someone is going to some site, you should be able to block that traffic. Another thing that you might be able to do is allocate certain uh, bandwidth to certain IP address. So you should be able to do simple things like that very easily on these routers. Um, so that that's some of the so I haven't that's why I haven't decided exactly what the next assignment is. Uh, because there are lo lots of assignments left, and, and the the challenge is uh, fitting them uh, together. And the other reason why I'm interested in wireless routers is they're very pervasive. They're everywhere, and it's important to understand how they work, not just in terms of hardware, but also in terms of um, uh, the techniques, various techniques that the wireless routers use, even if you're not trying to tweak them. One of the things that they use is a DHCP server, right? They're also DHCP server. And we already know what DHCP is. Uh, but uh, the other thing that they do is port forwarding. That's one of the things that you could use the routers to do, right? Another reason why routers are interesting is they challenge a particular way of deploying certain type of internet applications. For example, if you want to run servers at homes, that's a little bit challenging. And there are many standard techniques that people have developed. Are we going to study them? So some of these assignments will be in software. And if you finish uh, these assignments quickly on software, um, select students uh, will be able to implement them on the router. All right. Um, so that's uh, what's uh, coming up in terms of uh, assignments. And, uh, and some other assignments uh, that uh, I'm thinking about is I think I already gave you a hint that I'm going to have you compute latency across a large number of pairs of machines in the internet. So this is an exercise in uh, doing large-scale network performance-related data collection. And you've explored that to some extent in the homework that's due this week. You typically can use something like ping to find how long it takes for data to get to the destination server and for, for the acknowledgment to come back, right? But if I told you, OK, here are the 500 pairs of machines. Um, you know, give me a plot that shows latency across these 500 pairs. You're in a little bit of a trouble there. <laughs> so you need to learn how to automate those things. Any, any questions about some of these topics? So of the mechanisms that we discussed in the class, you definitely want to understand, understand them in concrete details. I'll give you an example from TCP. It's one thing to say TCP is going to increase the rate and decrease the rate. Uh, that's a surface level understanding. And uh, that's not adequate. You should be able to calculate some you know, average rates, average window sizes, depending on the uh, particular way in which I tell you the window evolves. Right? For example, you should be able to determine how many packets are sent. Uh, by the sender if uh, we, take, we tweak the slow start behavior um, to make it linear instead of an exponential increase. Instead of double it every round trip time, let's say you just uh, um, do a linear increase every round trip time. You should be able to calculate these numbers. Um, 
if I give you a sequence of, um, if I give you a protocol timing diagram and I remove some arrows, you should be able to fill it up. Right? And a text version of that would be if I give you a table with a sequence of packet numbers, then you should be able to write down the, sequ uh, the data sequence numbers and act sequence numbers. And some of this might be tricky, right? For example, you know, what if you receive you know, two double acts, then what do you do? Two duplicate acts versus three duplicate acts, things like that. So that will require you to understand these mechanisms in concrete detail, saying, OK, if I receive data with this sequence number, am I going to send an act or no? Am I just going to wait for timeout? Things like that. I will modify uh, various things. For example, the red curve that we saw. Right? I also I gave, gave, gave it to you as a practice problem. So rather than using the particular thresholds or a particular shape that determines the probability of marking, uh, you know, what if you change that curve? And why would you ever want to do that? Um, so yeah, I think uh, you will not be able to look at your notes and just directly put it down on the exam. That is, that is going to be a very rare, rare thing. Okay, but if you understand the concepts, uh, it should be pretty straightforward. So um, definitely s spend your time learning how the basic TCP mechanisms work. And um, and how DNS works, DNS uh, delegation works, for example. Right. So what happens if I want to find the IP address for a particular name? You should know how that process roughly works. Right. For example, is there a hierarchy of servers, or there's just one server answering this question? And uh, how do the servers negotiate who should respond to what? If there are multiple servers, um, I'll ask you some questions. Um, you know about uh, some of these uh, TCP tweaks that we talked about. Yes. I have a question about the test. Uh -huh. <clears throat> For like, we, we spent most of our time talking about TCP, but we didn't spend a lot of time looking at UDP or yeah. other types of connections. Yeah. So. Are there going to be questions about UDP or peer-to-peer? -peer? Uh, to, to, the, to the extent uh, that um, you, 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 should, yeah, you should know, for example, if you write an application that uses UDP, um, should you ever try to paste the packets in a particular way, basically TCP-friendly 